the word LIFT to 797979. Finally, a formula that boosts total testosterone. If your results with Ageless Male Max are too intense, please decrease use. For your free bottle, text LIFT to 797979. Text L-I-F-T to 797979. On this week's Adam Schefter podcast, in the same week as the NBA draft, we'll be joined by the great NBA insider, Adrian Wojnarowski. He'll lend some insight into where LeBron James might wind up, discuss the upcoming free agent summer, and we'll compare and contrast our notes on what it's like to be an insider for the NFL and the NBA. Without further ado, my friend, Adrian Wojnarowski. All right, Woj. We're going to try to get through the next 20, 30 minutes without too many interruptions, without the phone going <laughs> off. It already went off before we started to do this. Yep. So we'll see if anything happens here with LeBron or Durant or Kawhi Leonard or anything that we're working on, you're working on here for this upcoming podcast. First of all, I should thank you for this actual podcast because without you, this would not be happening right now. This would not my, be in existence. may have been my greatest contribution so far to ESPN. Well, I doubt that, but... I can honestly say that when we had dinner a couple of years ago, roughly, mm-hmm. right, you said you really should do a podcast. And nobody had suggested that to me at this time. And the company wasn't interested in having me do a podcast. So, Did you twisted some arms here? No, with your pushing and backing, I went to some people <laughs> and I said, well, maybe we should try a podcast. And so here we are. And this might be the demise of it this <laughs> week, but all your NFL followers going, what is this about? Well, I'll tell you what this is about. First of all, I have the greatest NBA newsman on. That's number one. I have my good friend on, my consultant, my fellow (laughs) advisor, my psychologist, all those things. And we have you on in the week of the NBA draft. Yep. So what other time is there to get on, my friend, than in the week of the NBA draft, right before free agency, to talk about what this experience would be like? I also should mention that you're being honored as the National Sports Writer of the Year on June 25th in Salisbury, North Carolina. So congratulations to you on that tremendous award. That You ever won a more meaningful award than that? Um, well, yeah, I think meaningful, but it's – it's uh, when you look at the list of winners, like you go, <laughs> which one's not like the others? I mean, like guys I grew up idolizing who, uh, you know, a lot of icons of the industry um, – don't know that I fit in with them, but but I'm honored to uh, I'm honored by it, and uh, yeah. But it is draft. Well, it'll be the week after the draft for free agency. Uh, but my my draft week is the NBA draft is so much different than the NFL draft, only because I think the walk up on the NFL draft is because there's such a vacuum of time, right? Where there's post Super Bowl, where it is the story, where the NBA draft sort of kind of sneaks up on people on the heels of the playoffs. It's different. <laughs> so, Woj, you've been at ESPN for almost a year now. This will be your first NBA draft. What do you envision this being like for you? Well, what's been great so far, and we've done a lot of, you know, I think we've built out some more programming, draft shows, and then having Jonathan Gavoni, Mike Schmitz at ESPN, I mean, that really the two most really the two preeminent draft experts in the world uh, mm. who know the college game, know the international game, have watched uh, over a very long period of time almost everybody in this draft. And the international players, you know, they've charted Luka Doncic since he was, you know, he's 19 now. They've been on him since he was 15, 16 years old. Um, having those guys is, is tremendous. But then being able to work with, you know, Jay Billis, I've gotten to know him a lot better here through this, and he's been – just incredible, like welcoming into their group and, um, it'll be a lot of fun. It's, it's to me the, I think there's going to be a lot of action and trade. I think there's going to be some trades up in the lottery. I think there's going to be a lot of moving around. I think teams value guys. It's such different. There's not a great consensus after the first, really after one, there's not a consensus. So I think there'll be some teams trying to get, trying to get up higher and some teams trying to get out. So to me, that's always the, 
the fun part of the trades and, and teams targeting guys trying to get up to get them. And then you've got it right on the heels of free agency, which comes just you know, a little over a week later, which is anytime LeBron's involved, it's a huge free agency market and, and period. Best guess today, best guess on where LeBron's going. I don't want to guess. I, I just... I hate guessing as a reporter. Yeah, I, I, I just think that this is the most complicated decision he's had in some ways, and maybe in the end, he knew all along. Maybe this will be one where he's known all along. I know L.A. makes a lot of sense to people um, from a perspective bigger than just basketball of, of kind of putting planting his flag out in Hollywood and all of those things. Um, there's not an obvious, if I sign and go here, we are set up to win championships or to catch Golden State. Golden State has complicated everybody's thought process, whether it's LeBron's, Paul George, Houston, Oklahoma City, the the money that they're, the financial commitment that it's taking to try to compete with that Golden State roster, the luxury tax that Houston's probably going to have to pay, that Oklahoma City's going to pay if Paul George stays and Carmelo Anthony opts back in. Uh, it's remarkable how much the th- Warriors have changed the league. They change it the way they play, style of play, um, shooting threes and, and, and the way they built it out stylistically, but they've changed it from a business as a business model. And, and then Golden State's got a lot of really tough questions, um, in terms of salary and how much do they want to, how much luxury tax do they want to pay? How far, how deep into the tax do they want to go? Can they pay everybody and keep this thing together long term? They've they've got tough decisions to make too coming up. Not this year, but maybe starting next year. Who would be the first warrior to leave of that group, if you had to guess? And again, I'm asking you to guess again, which I shouldn't be doing because I don't like when people ask me to guess because when you guess, all of a sudden it becomes a headline. Well, Woj says that <clears throat> LeBron's going to LA or Clay Thompson's leaving the Warriors. But if there's one warrior that you would guess Well, I think it's gonna depend on who's willing to take to keep this together, they've all got to take, well, there's going to have to be a discount. Now, Steph Curry took the full max after he was very underpaid. You know, he was on a four year, $44 million deal. There were times a couple of years ago where he was the fifth highest paid player on the floor, uh, because he had signed his first extension when he was having the ankle injuries. And, um, I remember at the time people thought, geez, that's a lot for Steph Curry. He's got these, could have a career ending injury. Why, why are they paying him 11 million a year? Um, but I think, Clay Thompson and Draymond Green are going to have to take less if they both want to stay. Hmm. I think Clay seems open to it, and and I'm not saying Draymond isn't, um, but it's you just can't pay everybody. And if those guys want max contracts, it, it'll be harder. It'll be harder to keep it together. Um, it, it's it's really interesting because Durant has taken less here. In a couple of these one-year deals to allow them to keep Iguodala, um, Sean Livingston, to allow them to keep some of those role players. And that's um, sometimes when the star player does that, it sets the precedent for the rest of the group. Um, but, you know, they're still, we're still a year out from having those guys having to make those decisions uh, on, on their contracts. And this will be the summer of LeBron, and we started to talk about him. Here's what struck me again I don't cover the NBA, I do it for fun. But, when I'm reading his comments and listening to his comments then after the game where he's saying, I don't know what's going to happen, I haven't thought about it, I said to myself, if he's coming back to Cleveland, it's a very simple conversation to have. You just end the speculation right there. And he's never done that. He's never squashed it. He's never said, guys, why are we talking about this? Why is this a subject? I'm not going anywhere. He's never once said that, which is why I think the door is open and there is so much speculation on where he's going to wind up going. No, and, I, it's, it's, and I do think he's leaving. Yeah, well, there's no question it's wide open. And last summer, they could have acquired Paul George. And I think Paul George wanted to know, well, if LeBron commits to some years going forward, then, then I might be willing to commit. And when LeBron wasn't willing to commit um, and, and commit to an extension, that told me, I mean, he could have. they could have had Paul George. They could have had... And they could have done that without losing Kyrie. Um, it's a very different team. Kyrie Irving, Paul George, LeBron James. And so when he wasn't ready to do that then, 
you had to be, and Cleveland was worried, and, and rightly so. They they don't want to get left again where um, they don't get anything for him or they've loaded up on bad contracts to try to help to convince him to stay. Um, they did take on more money in that Lakers trade, but they took on younger players who they, you know, in their minds could keep going forward without LeBron. But, you know, they've got the eighth pick in the draft. Uh, I think they're going to make that pick independent. They're not going to get direction from LeBron. He's not going to tell them, geez, I like this guy. I like that. Like, right. he's not going to give them direction. They're going to have to fly blind and they'll pick the player there that makes sense. I think, um, without him, like they have to assume he's leaving or, um, they're going to be, uh, put in an even more difficult position. It's never easy to have him walk out the door, but they have contracts like Tristan Thompson, J.R. Smith that they're stuck with. If he's gone and a team that's not really built to play around him, uh, to play without him. And so, um, uh, yeah, you're right. He, he could have made this if he wanted to be there and if he was going to be there, uh, he could have settled this. He hasn't. So it, it's obvious he's looking, uh, that doesn't mean he won't stay, but, um, they're going to have to sweat it out if he does. We'll be back with more of my conversation with Woj in a second, but first I need you to listen up, people. We've got a big favor to ask, and we promise it won't take up too much of your time. You know, our show is supported by some fantastic sponsors, right? Well, we'd love to hear your feedback. Head to ESPNPodcastStudy.com and fill out a short, anonymous survey. That's it, we swear. Again, that's ESPNPodcastStudy.com. I'm a one-trick pony, literally. I show up at kids' parties and act cute. That's pretty much it. So excuse me for being bitter. When Geico says not only could we save you money on car insurance, but we do more, like give you 24-7 access online, over the phone, or even via our award-winning mobile app. Well, ooh la la, aren't they multi-talented? <laughs> hey, I said organic carrots. <laughs> Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. So you've now been at ESPN, like we said, almost a year. What has been the one thing that has most surprised you? Because I think a lot of people were surprised when you came to work here. You were a, a critic of the company, outspoken. I was a competitor. A competitor. I was a competitor of the company. <laughs> That's a good way of saying it. Yeah. Okay, so you were a competitor. Yeah. And now you're on the team. Yep. What are your thoughts being on the team? Is it what you thought it would be? <clears throat> you know, the second or third night I was here... Second or third day in free agency, I remember saying to somebody, and I remember saying it to myself, that I was proud of what we built outside of this structure and this monolith, and this platform is enormous, and it reaches people in lots of many more ways than I ever did before, and that I was proud of what, over the years, we had built outside of it because I appreciated that better once I was inside of ESPN, mm. that, that it, it really is an advantage to be here if you work hard at it and do it. And, and then there's also times where I don't want to say it's like, you said this to me before we started, you said it's a little bit like going to the Yankees and no one's rooting for you. And there's some truth to that. And I accept, I accept all of it. Like it's fine. Like at the end of the day, it's it's an advantage to be here. There's no question. No one would ever convince me otherwise. And I think if you don't think it is, I think you're making excuses. But the platform and the reach, not just here, but globally, like <laughs> people watch you when they're pumping gas, right? Like the one minute. <laughs> I hear more people who say they watch me. I don't know what that says. I said like, yeah, this year you're, you know, like next year I'll be pumping your gas probably somewhere. But uh <laughs> That's a good. Uh, one. I'm going to steal that for the next time somebody <laughs> says they saw me. Well, yeah, they were pumping yeah, gas. It won't be long. Yeah. Before you came here, we had had some conversations about what this might be like. Has it been what I told you it would be? Almost exactly. Almost exactly. And I think, in the way that um, you told me that there would be a lot of people who want to help and help you do well, and are there to. Um, make it easier for you. And that's absolutely been the case. I mean, your responsibilities are different here. You're doing more television. You're, you're going to sit for radio. You're, you're doing, when you break a story, the responsibilities, like in my, typically I would just be onto the next one and I am mentally onto the next one, but you've got to, 
kind of feed the beast in the interim, right? Of you're going to do um, a number of sports centers that day or get up or go look and wingo, go look and wingo. Right. And so, which is great. And, um, and you're also mentally getting to the next one. Um, yeah, I, I've just, the infrastructure is so good. Uh, I always had great editors like at Yahoo, like Johnny Ludden, Joe Garza and, 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 uh, guys who, um, I always had great editors, like going back in the newspapers. I think like of all the newspaper jobs I had, I was always blessed with like really good editors, having people you could count on who, um, were there to make you better, challenge you, also have your back. Um, and that's been true here. Like I did, like Christina Douglas, who's our NBA digital editor. I didn't know her at all before we started and she had moved over to basketball right July one and, and I came in and Bobby Marks came in and the draft guys came in shortly after and like um lucky to have a great editor um and then to help you coordinate the digital and T V and you've got, you know, Hillary Guy who works out of LA. They're not names people may know, but like they make the thing go and um it's a great benefit to have people who out over time they start to figure out your strengths, where you thrive where you've got to work on um, and putting you in situations where you'll hopefully do well. And so I've always found here that there's people who want to make sure you get in those right situations. And I appreciate that. A support system, but they also leave you alone to do what you do. Yes. And they've been really good about like, if I just say, Hey, listen, I need time to, I'm working on something. I'm working on something and, um, and, and not to be asked to go on when you, you know, to me, it's like really important to say, I don't know. And sometimes, and I get it, like the shows want an answer. They want to, you know, we all have different roles here. And there's some people who um, are going to talk more in the abstract or hypotheticals, which is that's sports. That's part of the conversation. I don't want to be in those situations um, like the ones you just put me in um, <laughs> earlier in this show. But I want to deal in <laughs> fact and reporting, right. I know, as, in which I really watched how you did it. And I, I spent a lot of time on YouTube before I started and even after I started going back and watching how you frame news and how you, whether it was on air, um, well, obviously on air on YouTube and then obviously watching you here and uh, seeing how um, you went about sort of the, I could see where you would draw guidelines of where you would take analysis versus speculation where you, and I've always tried to keep it pretty narrow. Like, here's what I know. Here's what I know. Um, here's an informed idea of what could happen based on these facts, but, but, but not get too deep into speculation because I think when people see us, they want to know, like, you know, there's an expectation of fact reporting and, um, not, um, not hyperbole or not, um, certainly not speculation. No. Did you see my coughing fit? You study that one? I hope you didn't study that one. <clears throat> I did see that one. We've all. <laughs> we're it's all. still playing on the Howard Stern show. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah. Every now and then, just like you have people who see you pumping gas while they're pumping <laughs> gas. I've got people who say, hey, you were on the Howard Stern show today. I was. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a coughing fit. If you just Google Adam Schefter coughing fit, I guarantee you will crack up watching this mm -hmm. because there's a piece from my third week here when I was on with Sage Steele. And there was something caught in my throat just as they were putting me on air at that very moment. She was asking about the Panthers quarterback situation. And I started to cough and I tried to recover. And it was the beginning of my time there. It was so <laughs> embarrassing and humiliating. And I'm glad that we can laugh about it now. But if you go Google Adam Schefter coughing fit, I guarantee All you right. love, don't study that clip <clears throat> when you're studying things to do. Study that clip when you want to know what <laughs> not to do, Woj. I've seen it. I've seen it. Uh, what is it like for you? We talked about LeBron being back in Cleveland. What's it like for you, Woj, to be back in Bristol where you're from this area? Your dad still lives here. Yeah, my dad, my sister, my brother. Um, the thing that I have enjoyed the most since I came back here was has been my relationship with my high school, Bristol Central High School. And we started a program. Uh, as soon as I agreed to the deal here, the first thing I wanted to do was, uh, my wife and I wanted to do was um, uh, help my old high school English teacher who had been at Central for 50 years, who was retiring, 
um, to create a program that could keep her involved in the school, keep her involved with the students, uh, to have the impact she had on me with another generation. And, and we just had our dinner the other night. Um, it was actually between games three and four of the finals. I was in Cleveland. I flew home to Jersey. We came up, we went to the dinner and I flew back, did SVP, then flew back in the morning to Cleveland. And we, um, it, it was the, the, the group of kids we had, it was just tremendous. And they're from the same neighborhoods I grew up in and the same places where my friends hung out. And, and it's a blue collar town. And, um, just what a great group of kids who are part of the writing. It's called the writing initiative all year. They're going to great colleges and, um, you know, just, uh, the, the, being a part of that has been awesome. And, and I have, uh, to see their enthusiasm for, um, the, the opportunities that, that have been available through this, this year and, we had some scholarships and, and some awards that, that we gave out at the end of the year. Um, like I just felt better about like the town I grew up in and my school and, and the future because man, there's a, uh, it's been uplifting for me to, to, to kind of see through their eyes. And, uh, th- that's been as, uh, fulfilling, uh, for me as, as anything I've done over here. But there's got to be added meaning every time you drive in from Jersey to Bristol. And to know that your family's here, your high school's here, these students that you're helping are here, there's got to be an extra warm feeling that washes over you. You know, there was a moment my first day here. Um, I was walking across the campus, and it was, I guess, June 30th. It was like I wasn't on it. It was the day before. I guess I was here that day. And somebody grabbed me, uh, an older gentleman, and said to me, um, you know, everyone always talks about Aaron Hernandez in Bristol. Um all we've heard about is Aaron here the last few years or a lot of what we've heard about. Um, I'm glad you came back. Mm. Uh, and so, um, I mean, Hernandez, their family grew up, I mean, I don't know, one, two, three, like four blocks where my dad still is. And I can picture the house. I mean, we went to the same schools and he went to Bristol central and the teachers that I am close with and the principal Pete Winninger there, they were close with him. And that, that really affected this town. It affected my high school. Um, I thought Central took a lot of unfair blame for it. I thought Florida at times tried to put blame on Bristol. That probably belonged with them. And and in the end, he was accountable, culpable for obviously everything that happened. I, I always thought Central and Bristol got a little bit of an unfair, like Central wasn't some uh, football factory. There had never been an athlete like him. The greatest athlete, it's funny, Malcolm Huckabee, who works at ESPN, who does college basketball, was – played at Boston College and was in training camp at the Miami Heat a couple of times. He was the best athlete ever out of here. And actually, it's ironic. He's here, too, now on TV. But um, I'm defensive about it. I'm protective about it. It's a great town. and uh, But I do. Like, I have to drive through Waterbury on my way here. And, you know, I worked in Waterbury at the newspaper there for four years after college. Um, I never thought I was going to get out of Waterbury. And so I always have to drive by the paper on my way here. And I think about that. It's a long, you know, I worked at the Hartford Current through high school and college. You know, I covered UConn was my first beat. So like when I'm driving on 84 or 91, I, I think about like, um, I didn't imagine having, I mean, the job I have now, the job you have didn't really exist when we started. Like they, they became products of the industry changing. And so like, I know I'm lucky, like I'm lucky, um, to, to have the opportunity to be here and do this. And, and, uh, uh, and I appreciate the climb through newspapers I had. To make that drive every day and to go through those towns and to see your old familiar haunting spots, so to speak, that's got to be inspiring every time you pass one of them because it's a reminder of how far you've come in the journey. And by the way, I should say this, as I'm doing this, this is what I love. I I always feel like when I'm with Woj, it's like looking at a, a mirror figure because he's looking down at his phone, he's checking, he's answering a text as I'm answering the question. <laughs> and I don't even have to think that he's not listening because I know no, he's, he's listening, listening to me because that's how we've trained our minds. <laughs> it's you know, it's my wife and my family's criticism. Uh, You're not always present. But I know he's present even though he's not necessarily present and he's checking the phone to answer. Wait, what did, what did you say? My, what did, oh, my wife is on me all the time no, I'm about kidding, that. I'm kidding. Your I wife get on you about that? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. Yeah. That's... Yeah. I've lost all credibility with my kids and the phone. Like, hey, you know, put the phone down, do that. Like, I have no credibility in that area, as, as nor do you. 
I, I get on my daughter, nine years old, on the iPad all the time. I get off it. Yeah, you're, really? you're always on your phone. Yeah. Right? It's and, then, a, and then you know, well, it's my job. Well, congratulations. Right? <laughs> they don't that doesn't care. work either. That no. Doesn't, so, that, so what do you do to solve that situation? You got any advice for me there, Woj? Um, well, you know this, and we talk about this a lot, Is is um, and it's hard. It's hard to be um, – we're on call all the time and, and you have to be responsive all the time. Um, you can't just, when, when someone's calling or needs, have a question answered or information, like you've got to be available to them. It can't be two or three hours from now. Um, it's got to be now or when you need somebody, like they may not be available to you. And so, as you know, it's a two way street. And so a lot of our day is spent just talking with people. And, and I'm sure with, I know it's the same with you. You might have, 30 or 40 conversations with somebody that never have anything to do with the reporting of a story. And when something's happening and it's going down and you're making call number 41, you hope like you're, you're in position to be able to get it. Um, but, uh, that's the, you know, it's 365 days literally. Um, and if you're not willing to commit it in that way, it's, you know, it's hard to do it because there's a line down the street and around the corner are people who, who are willing to do it. And so, but there's no question there are, there's a price to pay with your own family for, you know, as you're maintaining these relationships everywhere else, you better be concentrating on, uh, your most important relationships, which are your, your wife, your kids, your, your family. I can say I've been married to my wife now 11 years this month. We've been together for 12. Uh, our older son, uh, just turned, was turning 18 years old this week. Uh, the son that she had with her first husband who passed away on 9-11. Our daughter is nine. But nobody gets me like you, Oj. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll bet I could say the same selfishly and arrogantly about you. As much as you love your wife and your two children, I'll bet I get you as well <laughs> or better than them. When I see, I'll see you in the calf and there'll be a look of angst or frustration. I know exactly what it is. We We spent, I think it was around NFL free agency, I was up here. And I want to say there wasn't a ton going on, and I I tagged around with you one morning, and I just watched you work. I watched you on the phones, listened to you on the phones, and it was pretty instructive. I've always learned – I've learned a lot of things from you, including have your second phone be with a different carrier, right? So if you have one with Verizon, have the other be with AT&T. And I have found that, that there are times the text messages are a lot quicker through – for whatever reason, you're in a bad spot, and you look at your phone – you're, and you go, wow, that one came in five minutes later. That could have been disastrous if it was something really important. So those are the little tips we learn along the way. What? Where did the term Woj Bomb originate? I have no idea. I really don't. Um, I saw it, I guess, at some point on the Internet, on Twitter. Um, I don't really like, like, it's not a term I use or I'm comfortable using, but I understand other people do, and it's part of the whole it sort of took on a life of its own. Um, but uh, <laughs> I don't know who coined it or whatever. I mean, but... Uh, it's kind of cool. I don't know its genesis. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Like a Woj bomb is more powerful than an atom bomb. <laughs> you would never think that, right? But the, an atom bomb doesn't even exist, even though it exists in real life. I've never heard an atom Was bomb. Was A-D-A-M or, or A-T-O-M? A-T-O-M. Okay, okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you, you got yeah. my, whatever the English <laughs> phrase for that word is, what, an onomatopoeia or whatever. I have no idea. <laughs> what is that? When you have the meaning of a word that's spelled in another way, whatever that whatever that means. I want to thank you for the Woj bomb on John Beeline, keeping him at the University of Michigan. That worked out very well. Yeah, how about well. that? Yeah, I saw that. It was a, Well, you know, you've covered those. When the college coaches get involved in the pro searches. Sticky. It is. And, and, and the pro guys typically are fine with, there's not a lot of, it's the same group of guys typically that are interviewing for jobs and assistants usually don't mind their names being involved or having it public, but college coaches have to be a little more deft about it. But I, I don't think for beeline, I know sometimes people will, they think it quote unquote hurts recruiting. It doesn't like if I'm John beeline, like it was a benefit that an NBA team and teams, there's been other teams interested in him through the years. There's a benefit that um, like I get when you might be talking to another college and you might leave for another school that that hurts you. But when your name is mentioned in the NBA, Calipari, I think, always loved while he will credibility. It is. And, and it's something you end up selling and recruiting. And well, 
the NBA wants me, so why wouldn't you want to come play for me? I'm, yeah. they, they see me as an NBA coach, or I can prepare you for the league. I think it helps John Beeline. I, but I get once his name was out there and he was involved, there's only so long a coach of that stature doesn't also want to be in a competition, whereas Dwayne Casey or an assistant coach from somewhere else, they don't want to be seen as having to compete for the job. They want to be able to have it offered, turn it down, take it, whatever. And and so as it lingered a day or two, uh, I think he started to move to to exit out of it. So here's some of the reasons that I'm thankful for you, respect you so much, I have such great admiration for you. You helped keep John Beeline at Michigan, the <laughs> National Sports Writer of the Year. And you're a senior, senior NBA insider. I've been at ESPN now for nine years. I don't have... Get a, a better, senior title. You need to get a better agent. I obviously do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how I got it. I, I got it. I got here, and it was on my. Um, it was on my. Uh, I don't know my ID. So I'll take it. That's a great title. Mort is the senior NFL oh, insider. Okay. I think that may be. And you know what? Listen, I'll defer to Mort every time. I love Mort. And nope. if, he, if he wants to have my senior title, he can have it as long as he's here. I hope he's senior for the next thirty years Absolutely. here at ESPN. I'll be the junior. In every sense of the word, physical, literative. I want to tell you NFL that was insider. A, that was a big deal. The first day I was in, the, I walked in the green room and Mort was sitting there. Um, I knew you, and we had gotten to know each other um, prior to me coming here. Uh, I didn't know Mort at all, but like Is you think of the guys, yeah, and you think of the guys who really paved the way. You know, like he was a sports writer who, um, you know, Will McDonough, who you knew oh. well, and you came up in the business as one of your idols. You know, his son. Ryan's the general manager with the Suns, and obviously Sean McDonough, who works at ESPN, and Terry McDonough works for the Cardinals uh, in the NFL. But um, I always, whenever I'm with Ryan McDonough, or uh, we're talking many times, as much as I want to pick his brain about what's going on with the Suns or what he thinks about a free agent or a draft pick, like I love getting Will McDonough oh, yeah. stories from him. I love hearing him tell me stories about his father, um, who... Uh, was, you know, bigger than life, right? Really a bigger than life figure in our business. Um, yeah. There was a time that I flew into the NFL owners meetings in March in Phoenix, and I was at the baggage claim. And it had to be roughly in the year 1999, 2000. And Will McDonough was standing there and went over to him and he said, come on, kid, come with me. I said, where are we going? We're going to go to the owners meetings together. He says, let's get a limo. A limo? <laughs> he got a limo to take us to the owners meeting. He says, you want to arrive in style? And we took a 20-minute ride from the airport over to the Biltmore in Phoenix, and I was peppering him with questions the entire time. And, of course, later that year or a year or two later, he helped get me into the Boston Marathon, which is a whole story in and of itself where I almost died and wound up in the hospital with rhabdomyolysis. True oh. story. Um, but he got me in there, and he died that next year. And he was a legend and a titan in the industry and somebody that to this day I still worship and idolize and I could hear about and read about. And never get enough of that particular individual, which is why I'm always so fascinated with Sean McDonough and Terry McDonough and Ryan McDonough and anyone in the McDonough family. Yeah. Like just an unbelievably accomplished family. In fact, I was in Salisbury, North Carolina, where Will McDonough was once honored as yeah. the National Sports Writer of the Year, the award that you're going to be picking up and receiving on June 25th. Yet another reason to be very respectful of the great Woj. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I when I was 23, 24, when I was working in Waterbury, I had won that they had st they have state awards they still do, and I somehow won the Connecticut Sports Writer of the Year <laughs> when I was covering UConn and Waterbury, and we went down. My wife and I went down to that weekend. They had this great weekend there, and uh, Peter Gammons was the National mm. Sports Writer of the Year. And I remember I got my photo taken um, with Peter Gammons. I still have it somewhere uh, at home, but I stood there. You held your plaque, and you stop and you pose for a picture with Gammons and like, Hey, listen, I grew up reading the globe, you know, New England kid, Red Sox fan, Celtic fan. Uh, I was a Patriot fan of like Steve Grogan and Sam Bam Cunningham and that group when I was a kid. And your son still is. He's a huge, yeah, he's, he's had a different era of Patriot, um, <laughs> a Patriot glory. Um, but like reading the Sunday globe, reading Gammons, Bob Ryan, um, Obviously, Will McDonough, like, that's all I ever wanted to do. Hall of Fame sports writers. Yeah, I mean, like, there'll never be a group like that together again. And I think of, uh, uh, that's all I ever wanted to be was a newspaper writer. Like, I'll, I mean, I worked at the Harvard Current and as a part-timer. And, like, my goal was, like, I wanted the University of Hartford basketball beat. I thought, 
You get to make a couple overnight trips to like Durham, New Hampshire, or in Maine. They play BU. You get to stay in Boston for a night. Like I thought, and then in the spring and fall, you would do like the local Division Three Wesley and Trinity football or uh, NCAA tournament baseball. I was like, that would be a great job. And you know what? I, I and I still really believe if that's what I did, I would have been fulfilled. I never imagined like <laughs> what this whole thing would become. Uh, I just wanted to be that guy and. And I would have been happy being that. Guy. You know what's funny? I had aspirations to be simply a newspaper beat man. When I got the Denver Broncos beat job, I couldn't have been happier. Wanted to cover the Colorado Rockies when they got there. Didn't get the job. Was forced to be stuck on the Broncos and NFL beat. And if I had done that the rest of my life, I would have thought there couldn't be anything better than that. And like you, never imagined that these kinds of jobs would exist, that they would grow into what they are today, that we would be as fortunate and blessed as we are to do these jobs for such a great company and network around such great people. And so basically at our roots, we're two East Coast guys who just wanted to report on sports, like sports, yeah. love sports. And here we are today. Yeah, I mean, you know, my dad worked, you know, 10 minutes from here, like at a, the factory's gone. It was, it's called New Departure Hyatt. And, um, you know, he worked there for 30 plus years in the factory. They made, he sharpened tools. They made ball bearings. Um, you know, like I drive around town and I see like old jobs I had, like working at the cemetery cutting grass. <laughs> There's a, um, there used to be a photo mat in the middle of a parking lot, hot, like strip mall parking lot. I worked in the photo mat. I worked like, selling shoes in the Bristol Center Mall, which I think is gone now. And so, like, uh, one summer I worked at um, a middle school, Northeast Middle School, as a custodian, and I had to have a razor blade and had to go through every desk in the school and scrape all the gum off the bottom of the desk. I never put gum under a desk ever because somebody has to – don't do that. Mm. Somebody has to scrape it off. And so, like, those were all the jobs I had around this town. So, like, I don't, yeah, I don't take this for granted. Woj, congratulations on all your awards, on all your success. Look forward to watching you Thursday night on ESPN's NBA draft coverage. And then again, in free agency, always love that time of the year. I know how important that must be Mm -hmm. to you. So get ready for that, and thank you for the time today. Thank you, Adam. It was a lot of fun. Appreciate it. A special thanks to my friend, ESPN NBA senior insider, Adrian Wojnowski. And thank you to the listeners for tuning in to another Adam Schefter podcast. We'll be back next week with another special guest. And until then, enjoy the NBA draft this week, everybody.